equity online, we got one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. There's nine. Yeah. There's nine of us in the room here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna teach uh sort of to the folks who are in the room. But so what what that means, I'll do my best to look at the screen uh when I remember. Um so if you got a question, you gotta speak up because uh I don't wanna miss you. So just unmute yourself and don't let me just plow right through because um, no. your questions are important. So let's get started. Everybody doing all right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I have had a doozy of a week. <laughs> oh my goodness, tired. But I will say, as I've said before, this is like my favorite thing to do. So let's pray, shall we? <clears throat> Lord, thanks for your word. Thank you for scripture. What a joy it is to study it with you. And we just ask for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God, would you come among us in power and give us your heart as we look into the pages of Isaiah. God, would you speak words of life to us? Um, penetrate our hearts with this word, God, in a way that matters and lasts. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, for those in the room, we got a new guy. Corey, Hi. tell us about you. Okay, so I'm Corey. I'm 31. I'm about to be 32. I'm a student at RTS right up the road. Um, thanks to, I want to say, a couple divine appointments, I've ended up at Incarnation as of late. I have a wife, Brittany, a daughter, Harper, who's about a year and a half old. And uh, yeah, I'm just happy to be here. She was at Little Bitty Thing. She was. Yeah. I saw you. I'm glad you remember. <laughs> you just started at RTS last yeah. week, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. It feels like it's been longer than that already, but yeah. And so you're doing the MDiv program. I am. We need to pray for this guy. I, I know what you're facing. I remember um, when I was in the middle of my MDiv, I'm trying not to fail Greek, and I pulled into a toll booth, and I got the flashcards out on my dashboard. I got the Greek textbook in my lap, and I'm pulling into the toll booth, and I stopped to pay the toll, and the toll lady's like, does your mom know you're doing that? <laughs> 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 she said, you need to pay attention. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just trying to pass Greek. <laughs> Help. Anyway. All right, here's what we're doing tonight. We're going to try and get through Isaiah chapter 7 through 12. Uh, for those of you who joined us last week, you got a little bit of a background to help you understand what's going on in this book. And I want to just point your attention to a document that's online. I just want to just show it just for a moment so uh, you know what I'm talking about. There is a structural document on the website that looks like this. That's a hot mess. Um, but what it's an attempt to do is it's my attempt to sort of walk you through um, trying to get that block out of the middle there. I don't know how to do it. Oh, well, here we go. Yeah, this is my attempt to sort of walk you through the content of the book of Isaiah. And what we did last week is we talked about chapter one through six, this first section of the book, which I said introduced sort of the main ideas of the book and give us the call of Isaiah preached on that on Sunday. Um, tonight, we're going to get through the second section of content of the book, which I'm calling Two Contrasting Kings, but it's chapter 7 through 12. The other way people think about this is the Ahaz narrative. So we're talking about tonight our 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We're talking about six chapters in the book of Isaiah that have to do with a completely different historical period than the one we talked about last week. And so I want to turn your attention to um, another document that is on the website, on the link, and it is the one that says four historical periods relevant to the study of Isaiah. Last week, we talked about the first historical period, which covers chapters one through six, and somebody, just by way of review, tell me something about those that historical period. There's a title for it, uh, The Golden Age of Jeroboam. But somebody describe for me what it was like to live in Judah during that golden age. Um, what was the climate like? What was the financial situation like? What was the spiritual situation like? Because things are radically going to change in 7 through 12, and you need to know the difference, all right? So, 
golden age of prosperity, right? Does anyone remember why things were so prosperous during this period of Israel's history? Yeah, so if you look at this map right here, and I know this is hard to see for those who are online, I apologize. Um, but we have the Mediterranean right here, and you have the major superpower to the north, the nation of, or to the south, the nation of Egypt. And then to the north, you have the Assyrians right here. They actually controlled over most of the Old Testament history, everything that's blue and green right here in this fertile area in the shape of a crescent. That's a joke from junior high, the fertile crescent. Right? <laughs> so uh, the Assyrians, the thing you need to know is the Assyrians are to the north, the Egyptians are to the south, and the Israelites are occupying this land bridge right in the middle. Um, Israel is really and truly the, the trade route from Egypt to the rest of the world. It was the only way to get to Egypt, which was the major superpower for most of the Old Testament era, to the rest of the world. And so because of that, it was very valuable real estate. And everybody that came through here was taxed and told on major roads that came through. And over chapters one through six in Isaiah, the Egyptians were weak and the Assyrians were weak, which means the Israelites were able to tax and govern all of their real estate when people came through. They got filthy rich because of it. The richer they got, the farther their hearts went from Yahweh. The nation deteriorated into all sorts of moral, spiritual, social decline. <laughs> and you see all of that rampant in chapter one through six. Do you remember that? Awesome. Okay. Chapter 7 through 12 is an entirely different period in, in Judah's history. And we're calling that during it's during the reign of King Ahaz, 735 to 715. And what's happening in chapter 7 through 12 is the nation to the north, the nation of Assyria, is strengthening under the reign of a serious, seriously awesome Assyrian leader named Tiglath Pileser. And that's described for you on the second handout, on the second part of this handout that I'm showing now. So will somebody read that? Um, somebody online just able to read that second paragraph of this handout for us during King Ahaz, just so we can all sort of familiarize ourselves with this time period. I'll read it. So... Assyria under Tiglath-Pileser III is much stronger now, pushing south into Israel and Syria. Syria and Israel are allied against Assyria. This is going to make your head spin, and I know that. Ahaz refuses to join their alliance. Ahaz chooses to align himself with Assyria and pays heavy tribute to Assyria for protection against Israel and Syria. Oh, my goodness. Everybody said it's smoking. I get it. Somebody read chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, and then we're going to look on the timeline, and this is going to make more sense. So I need somebody online, actually, who's feeling like reading. Will you please read Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 and 2? This is going to set us up for where we're going tonight. I will. All right, go ahead, Mom. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's see. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of, oh uh, dear, Remalia, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. When it was reported to the house of David, saying, the Ar Ar Arameans have camped in Ephraim. His heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to do something very risky here and take this computer closer to this timeline so that you all who are online can see this. But here's what, here's what I want you to see um, very briefly. We're looking at a timeline of all of the Old Testament era over here, kings of Israel and Judah. Um, if you know the way Saul, uh, First and Second Samuel begins, First, Second Samuel and the first part of First Kings, the nation of Israel is united under three really strong kings, Saul, David, and Solomon, okay? Um, what happens in 931 BC is that the kingdom of Israel splits. Can you all see this online? Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Okay, the, the kingdom of Israel splits north and south in 931 BC. You can see this in 1 Kings chapter 12. The nation of Israel, the whole Old Testament being about them, is, a, is involved in civil war from 931 BC all the way through the rest of their history in the Old Testament. It's really, really sad. Awful thing about God's people like fighting each other, right? 
And so what you have in the book of first and second Kings are the stories of the real Kings that lived during this portion of Israel's history when they were in civil war. And you have Kings reigning in the Northern part of Israel and you have Kings reigning in the Southern part of Israel. And this is broken up geographically like this. You have, hold on. All right, there we go. So this is Israel. And what you see is that the bottom half of this map is purple. The top half of this map is green. And there is a dividing line right here. The nation of the cap city of Jerusalem is right here where the temple was. Um, everything from Jerusalem south would be called Judah from 931 B.C. on. Everything from Jerusalem north would be called Israel from 931 BC on, and there would be different kings reigning in those regions. There was a king that controlled the northern part. He was called the king of Israel. There was a king that controlled the southern part. He was called the king of Judah, and they were at war with each other over this whole period. So this timeline over here shows you who the kings in Israel were, who the kings in Judah were, and it also shows you the major um, enemies that existed over this time period. And if you notice, the major enemies up to the top here are the nation of Aram or Syria and the nation of Assyria. Okay, so here's what's going on here um, on this map. And I apologize for the shakiness online. You guys, I'm doing my best here with this. Good. I'm really like a sorry excuse for 1990s technology. <laughs> so um, I got maps and charts. What can I do? Um, so you need to know, you need to understand this geographically though because this is super important. So here's the nation of Israel right here, and they have a problem. Tiglath Pileser, the king of the nation of Assyria, wants to come and own them. He wants to completely take them out. But if he's going to get to them, look who he has to go through. If you're a king in Judah in Jerusalem, and Tiglath Pileser of Assyria wants to take you out, he's got to get through two other kings first. He has to get through the Israelite king. Remember, those are the kings to the north. And he has to get through the Syrian king. You can see right here on this little, on this little map, there's a little word right here, Syria. Syria was a little nation state just to the north of Israel. And if Assyria is going to own Judah, they have to take out the Syrians and the Israelites. That's a good teacher. All right, so here's here's what's going on in chapter 7 through 12, and I'm going to show it to you on this map right here, and this is so important. Can you all see this? All right. We're talking about a book that is written in chapter 7 through 12 to King Ahaz right here, a king in the south, the king of Judah. And he is in a mess because King Pekah of Israel is in alliance with King Rezin of Syria. Okay, and King Rezin of Syria and King Pekah of Israel are terrified because this little guy, Tiglath Pileser of Assyria, wants to kill them all and they all know it. Okay, <laughs> and so Rezin and Pekah are going to join an alliance. These are the two little guys against the big dog, Tiglath Pileser. They're going to join an alliance and they're going to come to Ahaz and they're going to say, Join our alliance with us or we're going to kill you. And Ahaz is not stupid. He knows that Rezin and Pekah are nobodies. He knows that the, Assyri the Assyrians are way stronger than Syria and Israel. So he's like, I'm not going to join your alliance. I'm going to join an alliance with the Tiglath by Leser who wants to take you out. That's the situation of Isaiah chapter 7 through 12. And what God is going to do over and over in these chapters is he's going to say, Ahaz, stop being a moron. Right? You don't want to join alliance with Assyria. You don't want to join an alliance with Rezin or Pekka. You want to join alliance with me, Yahweh. If you'll get on your face and trust me, I will deliver you from Rezin. I will deliver you from Pekka. And I will deliver you from Tiglath Pileser. But you have a choice. Instead of writing checks to other nations, you need to get on your knees. Okay, that is the solid gold application of this section is that Ahaz has got to do the very uncomfortable and very abnormal thing that no king wants to do. Instead of trusting an alliance with a nation he can pay and see and speak to, he has to trust an alliance with an unseen God that he can't pay and that he can't see 
and that he doesn't know if he's going to deliver. So he's got to let go of what's known and comfortable, completely culturally normal, but wrong. Pay other kings to defend me. And he's got to embrace what's unknown, uncomfortable, but right. Get on your face and ask God to do for you what you can't do for yourself. And we are going to see this goofball make the wrong choice over and over and over again. And it's going to cost him most of his nation. That's chapter 7 through 12. So the question is, who will you trust? Who are you going to trust? Ahaz, who are you going to trust? And the application for us is like, man, um, what's our Assyria, right? What are we up against that is so big and so bad that you know you cannot defeat it on your own? And God is saying, hey, I'm inviting you to trust me with this. And we're saying, I got this. <laughs> All right, that's the application. Um, does that make sense? Any comments, thoughts, or questions before we get into the text? All right. I want to show you one other document just for fun. I'm not going to read it. You would all immediately log off. Um, but this document is also on the website. Can you see that? It says Ahaz, Hezekiah, and what to do about Assyria. Okay. Can you all see that online? Am I sharing the right document? Mm -hmm. Ahaz, Hezekiah, and what to do about Assyria. Okay. This is my attempt to barf out all the history that I just told you on one page. Okay. So um, you don't need to read it now, but it's just it's, it's a summary of what I just described for you. It describes what is called historically the syrio ephraimatic War. And the reason why it's called that historically is because those are the nations that were involved. Syria and Ephraim, Israel's surname was Ephraim over their Old Testament period. So scholars like to make things confusing, okay? So they say this period of Isaiah, chapter 7 through 12, is given amidst the backdrop of the syrio ephraimatic War. You're like, ooh, what is that? That sounds fancy. This is that political conundrum that I just described, that Ahaz is in. All right. So there you have it. And the reason why the handout says Ahaz and Hezekiah, and the reason why the chapters extend beyond chapter 12, is because we're coming back to this. Hezekiah, the next king, is going to be faced with the same stuff. And he's also going to make a stupid decision and get himself in big trouble. And if you look over here, Hold on. Um, so if you look right here on the timeline, look who reigns next. Ahaz disappears, and look who the next king in Judah is, Hezekiah. And chapters 36 through 38 of the book of Isaiah are going to be about him and his refusal to trust Yahweh against the invasions of Sargon II and Sennacherib, the two kings of Assyria who are going to be alive when he's reigning. And that's where we're going to go next week. So I think the application is let's learn from our mistakes before we have to make them again, right? Good gracious. All right. I lost the video. Hold on. Okay, so while I'm trying to figure this out, would somebody please volunteer and not i'm not sharing a screen right now am i no you guys can can you guys see me or can you see a handout you can see me oh good all right great so let's get into chapter seven we're going to really try and plow through a huge section of the content of this book tonight i would love for somebody to read chapter seven verses one through ten this is going to give us an introduction to this historical period i just described and we'll talk about it um, if somebody online is willing to read it, that would be the most beneficial for our online crowd, and we can hear you as well here in the room. So can I get somebody to read 7, 1 through 10? I'm just going to stare awkwardly until my mom. Go ahead. Go ahead. In the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzzah, King of Judah, 
king Rizan of Aram, and king Pekka, son of Ramaliah of Israel, went up to attack Jerusalem, but could not mount an attack against it. When the house of David heard that Aram had allied itself with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaac, to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz, you and your son shared Jeshau. At the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the father's field and say to him, take heed, be quiet, do not fear, and do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps and of firebrands, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Rehemala, because of Aram and Ephraim, the son of Rehemala, has plotted evil against you, saying, let us go up against Judah and cut off Jerusalem and conquer it for ourselves and make the son of Tabeel king in it. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I shall not stand, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered, and no longer a people. The head of Ephraim and Samaria, the head of Samaria is the son of Rehamala. If you do not stand firm in the faith, you shall not stand at all. All right. Does that make a little more sense after what we just described? So depending on what translation you're using, I, you know, you're going to see different names, but if you're into marking up your Bible, I mark my who's in green, okay? And so I would take green if you're coloring your Bible in verse one of chapter seven and mark the word Ahaz in the days of Ahaz. And if you want to write in your margin off to the side, you should say this is 735 and beyond. Or you might want to book in 735 to 701. And you might want to write in your margin. This is during the Syrio-Ephraimatic War. And you, you even might want to say something like Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria is terrifying Ahaz, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Remind yourself that that's what's going on. Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria is trying to kill Ahaz, and Ahaz has a choice. Am I going to trust Yahweh? Am I going to make an alliance with Reza and Pekah? Or am I going to make an alliance with Assyria? And that's what he's going to do. And that's going to really hurt. So you might want to make yourself a little mark there. And then look at these names, right? Verse 1, King Rezin of Aram and King Pekah went up to Israel. So remember, Rezin is the king of Aram, which the Bible calls the nation of Syria Aram. So if your translation says Aram, you might want to write, that's Syria. And King Pekah, son of Remaliah, was the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And so they come to Judah and they say, hey, join our alliance. But Ju Judah doesn't want to do it. And so they try and take him out. And Ahaz is terrified. So God in his graciousness sends the prophets. Now, remember who the prophets were. The prophets were um, the mouthpiece of God for Israel during this period of the kings. So if you look over on this map here, you can see all the prophets and where they exist on this timeline. Those of you online, you can't see it. But you can see that Isaiah spoke during this period where Israel and Judah were living under the reigns of Ahaz and Hezekiah. In fact, he spoke during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, and Ahaz and Hezekiah. You see that in Isaiah chapter 1. Um, but they really do function as the voice of God in the midst of these troubled times in Israel. And God in his graciousness is going to come to Ahaz and say, hey, buddy, don't sweat these guys. Don't even think about them. I got this. And um, 
he's going to give Ahaz an opportunity to trust him and to be relieved of the emotional anxiety of worry and fear. And Ahaz is not going to take him up on that. And I would just uh, encourage myself along with you to, to not make the same mistake over and over again, right? When the Lord speaks those words of, I got this, like, trust me. And we hear it for 10 seconds and then immediately go back into task mode of figuring it out ourselves. Anyone know what that looks like? And what it looked like for Ahaz, actually, is um, this conversation with Isaiah at this particular geographical location. And I want to point it out for you. Um, chapter 7, verse 3, Isaiah goes out and meets King Ahaz with his son. And look where he meets him, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway of the fuller's field. He goes to this, and I would underline that, the end of the upper conduit of the pool at the highway to the fuller's field. You think, why is this random detail mentioned in this section of the book? Because we're going to come back to it in chapter 36. And if you're taking notes, you might want to just mark yourself a little footnote there and say, see chapter 36, verses 1 through 10. Let me make sure I give you the right reference there. Hold on. 36. Yeah, heck yeah. Verses 1 through 10. Because at this little pool, in this little field outside Jerusalem, Isaiah is going to speak these tender words, trust God, Ahaz. And Ahaz is going to choose to make an alliance with Assyria. And in chapter 36, verses 1 through 10, because of this choice to trust Assyria over God, the general of the Assyrian army, the Rabshakeh, is going to stand in that same exact spot and tell the next king, Hezekiah, I'm going to spread your own poop on your face and kill your children in front of you. I hate to sound graphic, but that is exactly what's said in chapter 36, verses 1 through 10. And so what we're going to see in the next three chapters is Isaiah say to Ahaz, because you've rejected the soft whisper of Yahweh, the Lord is going to bring on you the mighty floodwaters of the Assyrian. And, and we'll see it in chapter 36. And then just think, God, please help me <laughs> to not face the flood of my own disastrous failure to trust you when you ask me to, right? That's really all I want you to hear tonight. You're just going to hear it over and over again in this text, all right? So any thoughts or comments about that before we keep going? All right, there's another layer here that's going to make this set, this section even more fun, but also a little bit harder to understand. Um, if you like to make sort of titles in your Bible, chapter 7 through 12 is usually either called the Ahaz narrative or it's called two contrasting kings. And let me tell you why it's called two contrasting kings. Because we're seeing the worst of King Ahaz and his failure to lead. And Isaiah is going to go to Ahaz over and over again and say, lead well, lead well, lead well. And Ahaz is going to say, no, thanks, no, thanks, no, thanks. And then Ahaz is going to say, well, guess what? God's going to bring another, or, sorry, Isaiah is going to say, guess what? God's going to bring another leader who is going to lead well. And remember how last week we talked about this sort of bipolar contrast where the prophet will immediately speak restoration right on the back of judgment and they just kind of bam and bam back and forth. In this section, 7 through 12, Ahaz is going to drop these predictive glimpses of King Jesus, who is going to be the exact opposite of King Ahaz in every way. He's going to contrast the poor leadership of King Ahaz with the righteous leadership of King Jesus, and he's going to blow us up with it over and over again, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, to sort of paint a picture of how Yahweh is going to undo the wretchedness of Ahaz. Pretty cool. The first little section of that is coming up in chapter 7, and I want someone to read it. Will someone read chapter 7, verses 10 through 17? Maybe someone online so we can all benefit from it. 
chapter 7, verse 10 through 17. I can read it. <clears throat> then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, ask, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then he said, listen now, o house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with his child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before, uh, where am I reading to? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm going to finish this up. Okay. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. So Isaiah goes, in as I said, hey, ask God, ask a sign from the Lord. God wants to prove his trustworthiness to you. Like, what is it? Do you want him to like make fire come out of my eyeballs? Or do you want to like, you know, blow something up at just the right time? Like, what's the sign? And Ahaz in this like religious awful kind of you know um vain glorious way is like oh heaven for me heaven forbid i ask god a sign i don't want to put him to the trust look that is just a religious cop out ahaz didn't give a rip about yahweh so don't read this as a righteous statement he's like i don't care about god i don't need a sign from god and so isaiah because he's speaking prophetically says well too bad buddy you're going to get one anyway you're going to get a sign of the ultimate faithfulness and trustworthiness of Yahweh. And it's a virgin who's going to bear a child whose name means God with us. And that is Jesus. And the reason we know that's Jesus is because Matthew in his gospel in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, quotes this very text and says, this was to fulfill the word by the prophet Isaiah. Look, a virgin will conceive and bear a child and he will be God with us. And you think, well, what the heck is this all about? Well, it's this contrasting king narrative that i'm describing for you but there's a gift for this in here for us and it's just this what is the ultimate sign of god's faithfulness like the ultimate sign of god's trustworthiness faithfulness and ability to come through for you and ahaz is the person of jesus his son god's like you want a sign of my faithfulness it's jesus and that sign wasn't just for Ahaz, that sign was for us. It's signs for the whole world. And so my, my thought for you is if you're if you're in a place where you just feel like God hasn't come through for you, you need to double down on the personal work of Jesus. He has come through for you. If you're in a place where you don't feel like he's trustworthy, you need to double down on the work of the cross. He is trustworthy. He is good. He is gracious. He is kind. And that has to do with his past actions more than his present ones, right? His past acts of faithfulness are more than enough for him to be worthy of your trust. Now, I'm telling you, I believe that about 30% of the time. So, uh, dialogue with me about that. Do you see it? I mean, what do you think? Tom, I have a question. Yeah. So, I mean... If Ahaz didn't give a rip about Jehovah, or I mean, how would this, how would this statement have meant, had any meaning for him? It wouldn't have had any meaning for him. And I think that's what's so interesting about this text is he'd already written God off and didn't care. And so God in his sort of winking providence is like, you know what, Ahaz, I'm going to give a sign for the whole world. Forget you, you know. It's and it would have been thrown right over his head. It's going right? to be Jesus, right now there are some who read this text and think well maybe there was a child that was actually born you know that was called Emmanuel that was in Ahaz's day but I, I don't think so um, mm. I think this has purely to do with Jesus and uh, I think it's something he never saw in his lifetime and the reason I think that is because Isaiah says before this child knows how to choose the good and the bad the nation before these two kings you're in dread is going to be empty and, and those nations weren't taken out until 722 to 701. So we're talking about 30 years in the future in Ahaz's life any, anyway. 
-hmm. and we'll talk more about that in the next few weeks but yeah i think this had nothing to do with it has unfortunately because he didn't want it to have anything to do with him mm -hmm. yeah well that's the thing is if you want something to happen now though you don't want to wait till uh you know generations down the road right I mean, it's not going to do Azaz any good that somebody's going to show up in the, the year one. Right. You're right. Ahaz wants something now. Yeah, he does. And um, and we want something now. We don't want to wait wait till our grand, great-grandchildren see it. You're right, Dad. And what, what's so sad, though, and what I don't want you to miss is that he could have had something now. Yeah. If he would have bent his knee and got on his face and asked God to do for him what he couldn't do himself, he would have been delivered from the Assyrians. But he wasn't. And um, he missed his opportunity because he refused to trust Yahweh and because he tried to take matters into his own hands. And look at what the result is. And Isaiah tells him, look in verse 18. Now, remember, if you, if you got your little symbol for judgment, time to get it out. We talked last week about three symbols, sin, judgment, and restoration, right? So get out your symbol for judgment, because look at what Isaiah says to Ahaz. Hey, you don't want to trust God? He's going to bring the house down on you. And look on verse 18, right? On that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the sources of the streams of Egypt and the bee that is in the land of Assyria. So Isaiah straight up tells him, if you choose not to trust Yahweh, he's going to bring the Assyrians down on your head. Which is interesting, because... Ahaz is going to make an alliance with Assyria. And they're not going to respect that alliance. Ahaz is going to give the Assyrians every bit of gold he has. He's going to give the Assyrians his own kids. And the Assyrians are still going to come and destroy his land. Boy, if that's not a lesson. All right. And look at verse uh, 20. On that day, the Lord will shave with a razor hired beyond the river. He will shave with the king of Assyria. I'll show you some slides next week, but what the king of Assyria will do when he comes and takes out the Judeans is he's going to hook their noses together and tie them up nose to nose to nose with big hooks. He's going to put them through their nose. And then to shame the men, he's going to take half their body. He's literally going to shave half their body straight down. Head, beard, chest, the whole thing straight down just to make fun of them and walk them out of town naked. And this is how they, this is how they destroyed cities. Um, and so that's what Ahaz is talking about, or Isaiah is talking about here. You see that repetition in verse 18, 20, 21, 22. On that day, on that day, on that day, on that day. He's talking about the day the Assyrians are going to come and destroy the nation. And look with me in chapter 8, verse 5. Somebody read chapter 8, verse 5 through 8. And listen to this really sad word that Isaiah gives Ahaz. This is really sad. Chapter 8, verse 5 through 8. Someone read that. Then the Lord spoke to me again and said, My care for the people of Judah is like sent and flowing waters of Shalom. But they have rejected me. They are rejoicing over what will happen to King Rezin and King Pekka. Therefore, the Lord will overwhelm me with a mighty flood from the Euphrates River, the king of Assyria, and all his glory. Mm. The flood will overflow all its channels and sweep into Judah until it is turned to be. It will spread its wings, submerge in your land from one end of the other, O Emmanuel. Um. This is one of my favorite sections of the book over this part of the book. There's so much in here. But Isaiah says to Ahaz, because you've rejected the waters that flow gently from Shiloh, you need to mark Shiloh as a geographical location. I, I mark it, and the way I mark geographical locations, I put a green box around. What's so important about Shiloh? Well, that was the first place of the location of the temple. When the tabernacle was brought from the wilderness in Numbers, they took it to Shiloh before they moved it to Jerusalem. David was the one that had the idea to make Jerusalem the capital city. 
before that point, the tabernacle that the Israelites followed around in the wilderness was at Shiloh. So when Isaiah says, because you refuse the waters that gently flow from Shiloh, he's saying, because you refuse the gentle invitation to come to the presence of God, you're going to face the mighty floodwaters of the king of Assyria. It's right, right there, right above Jerusalem. So, and it was the first location the tabernacle was moved to. So the imagery is, because you won't run to the presence of God in the house of God, you're going to face the wrath of the flood of the, the king of Assyria, which, who's coming from the Euphrates. And the reason why they say the Euphrates is because here's the Euphrates River. It is the thing that defines the Fertile Crescent here, which is the region of the nation of Assyria, this green. And um, look at the very end of the verse, right? Its wings, the nation of Assyria, will cover you up to your neck. Um, you see that in verse 8? That imagery of being covered up to the neck is a description of 701, and we'll talk more about this next week. But in 701 BC, the entire nation of Judah was destroyed except for the capital city, Jerusalem. And the imagery is your whole body is drowned out with the floodwaters of the Assyrians up to your neck. Ahaz is going to lose his entire nation except for his capital city because he refused the gentle whisper of Yahweh to trust him. And look at what Isaiah says after that, the end of verse 8. Oh, Manuel. He's using his own words against him, right? God said, ask a sign and I'll give you one. God will be with you. That's the sign. He's with you. And here Isaiah is saying, oh, you're going to want him with you on that day, right? Is the kind of, it's kind of the, the essence of that usage of Emmanuel. Oh, you're going to really want God's presence with you on that day. You're going to wish he was with you. All right, thoughts, comments, or questions about that before we move on? You guys getting it? It's the same stuff over and over. I'd love to hear the uh, story. <clears throat> if you did trust God, like what is, how, how should this movie, how should it have ended, you know? So, oh, well, come, <laughs> come back next week, Mel, because in chapter 36 through 38, we're going to see how it should end. And we're going to actually see it in archaeological stone. Um, oh, cool. Chapter 36 through 38, Hezekiah is in the very same situation. And after exhausting every option, chooses to trust Yahweh. And God completely destroys the entire army of the Assyrians overnight with a plague. He just wipes them out with a blink of an eye. 185,000 soldiers killed with a plague overnight. That's how the story is going to end. But mm -hmm. it's only going to go that way after the whole nation has been destroyed. And that's the part we want to learn from, right? Yeah. How can we translate this to today? Like if we ask for a sign and don't follow it, what happens to us today? What do y'all think? Great question. Yeah. So, I don't know if you can hear that, Wendy, but in what ways do you take things into your own hands instead of trusting the Lord? And when I first studied this as a mid 20 something broke Bible teacher, um, it was credit cards. That was the thing the Lord impressed upon me is what are you going to do, buddy, when you can't pay your bills, which was a regular occurrence? Are you going to charge the card or are you going to pray it in? And um, I, I praise God, we never ever ran a balance on the credit card. We just made a decision, Joy, that we are never going to spend money we don't have. We're going to get on our knees and ask the Lord to give it to us. And we did. 
Well, not always the way I want to in the amounts I want to. <laughs> <laughs> but he did. That was me. That was what it looked like for me. Well, you all I welcome your own thoughts and situations. Even if you you could have even stopped, dropped, and begged, and he could have presented to you something and you just didn't take it. Uh, how easily we distracted are as, as fallen creatures. Uh, he's still patient, his love still endures forever. And I think up until the end of your life, he offers you a chance to repent. What do you mean? So but that hand is always stretched out. If that hand is either going to stretch out and judge you, or you can grab onto that hand and that same hand that he stretches out. We'll see. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. And there's never there's never a point where you've woven enough train wreck life for yourself where you're beyond the redemption of God. It does that place doesn't exist. Um so whatever dark place you find yourself in, all the Lord is asking of you is to repent. Turn around. There he is. He's followed you into it. We're going to see that in the next couple of chapters, big time. I mean, I think if anyone's lived in sin or has sinned, they've experienced, you know, destruction in their lives, right? Or like, even, even if your sin is that you think that you're God or you can reason as God or you can like make amazing decisions and you don't need to rely on God. I mean, that's kind of putting yourself first or that's not loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. If you put yourself first, right. that's a sin. That's a sin we break every day that, you know, we can see the ramifications of, you know. Okay. Um, yes, we're, yes. We're not dealing with Assyria, but we have Ukraine, we have Russia, we have a government that's all split up in a million pieces. Uh, what's God going to do to fix it, or when? What are we supposed to do? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's we have an international mess too, and an internal mess, just like they did. You know what? I'm I'm going to answer that the way that I think the text answers it. As we get to chapter nine, I want you to hold that thought because. Remember this section contrasts the darkness of Israel's current situation with King Ahaz with the brightness of King Jesus. Over and over again, King Jesus is put forward as the one who will fix the, the political situation of Judah. The context is all political, and it does not mean that King Jesus will be a political king. It means that the politic of the kingdom, faith in the person and work of Christ, is going to be the way that God is going to rescue those who are dealing with the dark politic of King Ahaz. Um, I believe that's the answer the text gives. That's one satisfactory answer because we want to know, like, okay, do you know what? What right? Like, what I but I think it is a satisfactory answer in the sense that it really is the way God's going to heal the nations, and it's it's real. It really is the healing that He's after in all of our hearts that really does heal. Um, let's get there, okay? Before we do, I want you to do this. Take out your color code for trust, trusting God. If I, I would mark a theme of trusting God in the book of Isaiah, and you've seen it multiple times in this chapter, and I want to point it out. What I do is I mark the theme of trusting God in orange. I just take an orange. Every time the text is talking about trusting God, mark it in orange. And I want you to mark chapter 7, verse 9, where God says to Isaiah, if you do not stand firm in faith, you shall not stand at all. That's that theme of trusting God. These are beautiful verses to sort of put on your fridge or put in your car, not somewhere that impedes your view. But you know. Did you say 7 verse 8? Yeah, verse 9. Chapter 7 verse 9. If you oh. do not stand firm in faith, you shall not stand at all. Right? That's this idea of trusting God. And I want you to see in chapter 8, Israel and Judah are going to choose not to trust God, but God is going to speak to Isaiah directly at the end of chapter 8 and say, I don't care what they do. You personally trust me. He's going to speak directly to Isaiah, the man, and be like, the whole nation of Judah is going to go to him in basket. But I'm talking to you, Isaiah. 
as a person. You trust me. It was a really sweet word. And I want you to see that in chapter 8. Look at verse 11 through 13. Underline that as this theme of Isaiah personally trusting God. Um, I'll read it. For the Lord spoke thus to me while his hand was strong upon me, and he warned me not to walk in the way of his people, saying to me, don't call conspiracy all that these people call conspiracy, and don't fear what they fear, don't dread what they dread, but the Lord of hosts you shall regard as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. He will be a sanctuary to you, right? Yet a stone that Israel is struck against. In other words, God's like, look, I'm going to, Israel's failure to trust me is going to break them to pieces, right? But if you'll trust me, Isaiah, I'll be a refuge to you. Boy, that's a sweet word. That's a really sweet word. Um, my Bible marks that um, verse 14 as a messianic verse also. Well, um, Isaiah, uh, this section is quoted in Romans chapter 9, verse 33, as Paul talks about the Israelites stumbling over the person of Jesus, his fellow Israelites. So that's probably where they're getting that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's predictive in the sense that I don't think this passage is directly predicting the person and work of Jesus. Mm -hmm. But what Paul will do as a New Testament author is quote this passage to describe the ways in which the Israelites rejected Jesus, therefore stumbling over him. Mm. So it's a bit different than the Emmanuel passage, which is like clearly predicting Jesus. But the yeah. New Testament in chapter 9 of Romans is going to bring us into the life of Jesus. Yeah, I think that's what's going on there. Okay. Good question. All right. So, oh my goodness, we're never going to get through chapter 12, but that's okay. Uh we could stay up all night talking about this. Um, so, uh, so remember last week we talked about the sort of back and forth um, mania of the prophets where they, they're like, oh, you're going to get it. And then, boom, all of a sudden they're speaking restoration, right? You're going to see that in chapter 9, verse 1. Chapter 9, verse 1, pull out your color for restoration, which I mark in blue down the margins of my text. And here's the context. And, and don't miss this. This is so beautiful. Um, look, if you are Assyria and you're going to take over Judah, you're trying to get to Jerusalem, right? Um, look where you're going to have to come through first. You're going to have to come through the northern, northern regions. Now, I thought I had a map of the tribe of Israel. I don't. But the two northern tribes of Israel are Zebulon and Naphtali. Those are the two tribes of the northern region, which is called the Galilee in the New Testament. Okay, so if you live in Zebulon and Naphtali, you're going to be the one that's going to get killed first when the Assyrians come in. Okay, and Isaiah picks up on this imagery and he says, in the region that gets destroyed first and the worst, the brightness of the light of God's rescue will shine. Because who's from the region of Galilee? Who's from this little town of Capernaum and Nazareth right here? Jesus, right? Jesus is from this region of the eastern side, the western side of the shore of Galilee. And Isaiah is going to see that. He's going to say, oh my goodness, in the regions that got killed first through their rejection of Yahweh, in the darkest places, God is going to bring the, they're going to be the first ones to see the brightness of the rescue of Jesus. Which is why I said what I said, Dad. That God's rescue plan for this nation is Jesus. And so let's read chapter 9, very familiar text, verses 1 through 7. I'd mark it as restoration. Um, this is all about the person and work of Jesus. And it is all about a good king who's going to act different than Ahaz. Will someone read that? Chapter 9, verse 1 through 7. Maybe somebody online. I'll read it again. Okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> um, but there will be uh, no more gloom for her, her who was in anguish. 
In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt, but later on he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Thou shalt multiply the nation. Thou shalt increase their gladness. They will be glad in thy presence as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou shalt break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle of tumult and the cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace from the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Amen. When you see the language here of the ministry of Jesus is king language, isn't it? Right? And that's that contrast of good king, bad king. Like, hey, God's going to bring a good king to his people. He ain't going to be like Ahab. And, of course, Matthew in chapter 4 verse 15 and following quotes this directly and says this was Jesus wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace he is the way that God's going to heal the rebellion of Judah and I just want to put that for you all and say look um, are you willing to look to the person and work of Jesus as the primary way that the Lord has brought healing to the most broken places of your life. Is that enough? Is that enough? The person and work of Jesus, is it enough for you to say of God, you've done all you need to do for me, God, to show me your faithfulness and to bring healing and restoration into my life. That, that is a high bar. But I think it's the one this text is calling us to. So thoughts or comments about that? Well, even Jesus gets misinterpreted or misused these days. Uh, you have Christian nationalism. You have all this stuff where uh, people are trying to make Jesus into a it, it's sort of a, not the king, kind of king God's talking about, but uh, a, a nationalist thing. And we were never a, quote, our founding fathers were all kinds of things. They were deists. They were, uh, even though they were Anglican, they, this was never a, quote, fully Christian nation in that sense. Yeah, you're right, Dad. In, in the sense that we need to push everybody and make them all Christians like, as if they, like the people of the Inquisition. Well... <clears throat> I'm going to disagree with you on one point of this. I think the, the scripture gives us a pretty clear mandate that Jesus is the healing of the nations, and we should eagerly desire that everybody we know yeah. come and serve but, him. As but, a, I say, but we shouldn't do it by force. Make him a political uh, stump to wield against, you know, a political party. I agree with you there. We allegiance to the person of Jesus is. Uh, not um, d d is not a political statement in the, in the sense that it lines up with certain partisan politics in Western America. I get it. Yeah, that, that's what you're saying, and I agree with yeah. you. Yeah. No, I get it. Um, but I do. I do want everybody I know to to bend a knee and serve Him as Lord. If I didn't, I wouldn't be in this business. <laughs> I don't mind playing my cards there. I want everybody to know Jesus <laughs> and think that they should. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Dad. That's a good point. Someone else, any comments?
All right. Well, um, let's go on to chapter 10, right? Now, remember, you had three themes we're tracing through the prophets, sin, judgment, and restoration. We haven't seen a lot of sin yet in these chapters, but we're going to see some right here. So pull out your color code for sin and trace it down chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. We're going to see Isaiah sort of lambasting Judah for their sin, and then he's going to describe the judgment that's coming. So will somebody read chapter 10, verse 1 through 4? We're marking this as sin. And then we'll transition into judgment. And can you guess what the judgment's going to be that's coming to the sinful nation? It's the Assyrians. All right. So let's read chapter 10, verse 1 through 4. I'll do it. Okay. Why to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, to deprive the poor of their rights and rob the oppressed people of justice, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. What will you do on the day of reckoning when disaster comes from afar? To whom will you run for help? Where will you leave your riches? Nothing will remain but to cringe among the captives and fall among the slain. Yet for all of this, his anger is not turned away and his hand will, is still upraised. There's this condemnation against sort of the pride, injustice, idolatry of Judah at the time. And then Verse 5, we're going to shift to the judgment that's coming. And look, ah, Assyria, the rod of my anger, the club in their hand is my fury. That's God talking. He's saying, I'm using Assyria as an instrument of my judgment against you. Against, and then he says, look what he says, against a godless nation, I send them. Now, when you hear that, you should hear about, you should hear a story of another book early in your Old Testament where God sends a nation against another godless nation. And I'm talking about Joshua. Remember the whole book of Joshua? What's God doing? God is disciplining the seven nations of the promised land, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, the Ammonites, you know, the Gadites, the Hittites. The seven nations doomed to destruction. He's saying, I'm sending the Israelites as a rod of my discipline and judgment against these seven Canaanite nations. And I just think it is really interesting that now the rod is in another hand. And is and God and the same God that sent the Israelites to discipline and judge the, pe the pagan nations is now sending the pagan nations discipline and judge his own nation who has become just as godless as they were <laughs> and so i just think the um the clear application here is god's not playing favorites with the nations if you think the old testament is about god loving the israelites more than everybody else you're wrong <laughs> um he's on his own side here and uh now the Israelites are getting beat with the stick of the Assyrians, which is really sad and sucky. But that's what's going to happen. And look, look in verse 7. Look, this is not what he intends, nor does he have it in his mind. Right? So he's talking about the king of the Assyrians. He's saying the king of the Assyrians has no idea that he's been used as a pawn of my own will and desire. That's kind of interesting. And, and all these, these events are, um, so this is 735 when this is spoken. It would be, uh, it would be 722. It would be, it would be 14 years before the Assyrians would make it to Judah. This is a, this is 14 years in the future. And, uh, and I, Isaiah is calling it out here. And look in verse 12, right? When the Lord has finished all his work on Mount Zion, that's Jerusalem, he will punish the arrogant boasting of the king of Assyria. <laughs> so here's God saying, look, I'm going to use the Assyrians to discipline the Judeans. But as soon as I'm done with them, I'm bringing them down too, right? And so God's going to discipline and punish the Assyrians. And verse 13, he says, for the king of Assyria says, by, by the strength of my hand, I have done this. By my wisdom, I have... And my understanding, I've removed the boundaries of the people. 
blah, 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 blah. Look at verse 15. Shall an ax vaunt itself over the one who wields it? God is literally calling the nation of Assyria an ax in his hand. That's terrifying. Especially when you see what this nation really did to the people they destroyed. Skewered whole families like shish kebabs, you know, 4th of July barbecue. It's not good. Um, it is, right? I did good with that one, didn't I, Sue? You're in there, though. You can see it, can't you? Um, and here's God saying, I do what I want with the nations. Now, I, I believe that's still true about God. I'm just going to put that out there to you. I believe he still does what he wants with the nations. Now, I know that creates more questions than answers, but I think he's still sovereign over the nations of the world in that way. I really do. Uh, he has not stopped being God of the nations. And I'm not saying he's got nations that are his and ones that aren't. And I'm not saying America's a Christian nation. I'm not saying any of that stuff. I'm just saying God is in control of the nations, ours and everyone else's. And that brings some peace to me. I, I have that peace. And look, look at chapter 10. Look at this. God, Isaiah calls it. He says, I'm going to tell you how God is going to discipline the Assyrians. Look at chapter 7, verse 16. Therefore, or sorry, chapter 10, verse 16. Therefore, the sovereign Lord of hosts says, I will send wasting sickness among his stout warriors, and under his glory a burning will be kindled like a burning fire. The light of Israel will become a fire and a holy flame to burn and devour. devour. That is a prophetic description of events we're going to read about in chapter 36 through 38 when God sends a plague to destroy the entire army of the Assyrians when they are at the gates of Jerusalem. That's a prophetic description of that. So you go right off to the side. This is going to happen in 701 BC, and you can read about it in chapter 36 through 38. Really cool. But there's going to be some heartache first. So get out your color for judgment. We got to get through chapter 12 and I'm going to do it. Chapter 10, verse 28 and following. Chapter 10, verse 28 and following is a play-by-play -play geographic description of the siege route that the Assyrians are going to take when they come into Jerusalem. So they're going to come south through all these cities on their way to Jerusalem. And Isaiah is going to give us that siege route right here. Verse 28. He has gone up from Rimmon. The he is Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria. He has come to Aath, passed through Migron. At Michmash, he stores his baggage. Having crossed over the pass, he comes to Geba to lodge there for the night. In other words, Isaiah is given the, he's given the route. The Assyrians are going to come to take out the Judeans. Amazing, right? And look how the chapter ends, verse 34. So this description of judgment, you need to trace all the way down through verse 34. It gets brown in my text. I trace a brown line all the way down through the end of chapter 10. And look in verse 34. He, that's the king of Assyria, he will hack down the thickets of the forest with an axe and Lebanon with its majestic trees will fall. So the last picture we get here in chapter 10 is of the entire northern part of Israel, the Lebanon, which is up here near Mount Carmel, from this little notch north right here to the west of the Galilee. This whole portion being literally deforested, nothing but stumps, because when the Assyrians come in, they just hack down all the trees to build siege ramps against these cities. They literally take the trees and they build, like, um, you know, ramps to get up over the cities, walls with them. And Isaiah, so he says, the whole nation is going to be nothing but stumps. But one of those stumps is going to sprout. And God is going to bring tremendous restoration through that stump. And again, this is weird and cryptic and really cool. Instantly, we're back to a description of the person and work of Jesus, the root of Jesse the branch of Jeremiah, 
who will sprout and rule the nations in righteousness and peace. And it it's just why I'm saying the way God is going to heal the nation is through Jesus, period. The answer to your question, Dad. And so look in verse uh, chapter 11, verse 1. So chapter 11, verse 1 is that, and again, it's it takes a little while to get used to it. It's like, wait, 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 wait. We were just talking about destruction, and now we're talking about Jesus. There's no, like, heading. There's no, like, paragraph break. It's just a run-on sentence of craziness. And you just need to know this is how the prophets talk. They just shift back and forth instantly, and you just got to get used to it and comfortable with it. And then you just start to enjoy it. Um, and again, the picture is from the dark place of your own rejection of me. I'm going to bring the light of my restoration. Isn't that cool? From the stumps of your burned out life, here comes the restoration. Verse one, a shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse. That's the tribe of David. That's Jesus's lineage. A branch shall grow out of his roots. And look at this. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. Spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might. Remember, he's going to be a good king in every way that Ahaz wasn't. Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. On and on. These are very familiar passages. He will not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with, in other words, he's not going to follow political whims. That's the point. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, which is precisely the picture we see of Jesus, the very end of scripture in Revelation. He literally comes back to the earth with a sword coming out of his mouth. Scary. All right. And shall break with the breath of his lips the wicked. Righteousness will be the belt around his waist. Faithfulness the belt around his loins. And look, verse six, the wolf will lie down with the lamb. In other words, there's going to be a time of safety and peace in the land under the reign of this king like the world's never seen. And what you and I need to embrace is that never happened physically and materially in Israel. And so that is either one of two things. It is either a metaphorical picture of the real peace and safety that God has brought through Jesus that exists right now on planet Earth, or it's still a future event in our lifetime where God really will bring total peace and safety to planet Earth through the person of Jesus at his return. And you want to know what I think? It's both. I think it's a now and not yet reality. I think that there is a measure of peace and safety in the person of Jesus right now but God ain't done yet. There will be a time where he will literally break through the clouds and return. The New Testament is so clear about this. And he's going to rule and reign a kingdom that will never end physically on planet Earth. That's the story of the way scripture ends. Um, but, a, but, but, but a deposit of that has broken into the world now through his resurrection. So that's why theologians would say we live in the midst of a now and not yet kingdom. It's now, but it's not yet. What do you think about that? Curious your thoughts. I think it, it kind of goes back to the Garden of Eden. This, this is what the Garden of Eden would have looked like. This was it's a great thought. Before the fall, everything was, you know, happy. They walked with God. Everything was fine. No death in the world. No destruction. So the perfect creation became imperfect through sin. Jesus comes, he restores the fallen earth back to its true intention. Yes. And that's what it looks like. Uh, I love that. And I'll recommend two books The Epic of Eden by Sandra Richter and Heaven is a Place on Earth by Michael Whitmer, because they both say the same thing that the story of Scripture, Epic of Eden and Heaven is a Place on Earth. They both say the story of scripture is God giving us back what we lost in the garden. And that is so true. He's just taking us back to that garden we lost in the first three chapters. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amen. Epic of Eden is one of my favorite books because of that. It's so good. Even the title says it all, right? Yeah. 
All right. Uh, okay, I'm going to end with this. Um, one of my jokes for Isaiah, he's probably not going to like me for this <laughs> when I meet him, is that I, I jokingly call him the singing prophet. Have you ever seen Monty Python, Search for the Holy Grail, where there's this boy in a tower and his dad wants him to be king, but all he wants to do is sing, you know? This is kind of how he's like, what do you want to do when you grow? He's like, I just want to sing, Father. You know, he's like, no, 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 you don't want to sing. <laughs> you, you want to be the king. Well, um, this is how I think about Isaiah, because multiple times in this book, he gets so fired up about this restoration that God's going to bring that he just breaks out in the song. And um, you even have theologians say they call certain sections of this book Isaiah's songs. There's the servant songs from Isaiah 50 through 54, very famous pictures of Jesus. Well, the first song in this book is Isaiah chapter 12. He's so fired up about this restoration that's going to happen under King Jesus that he literally starts singing about it. And so chapter 12 is like Isaiah's made up song of celebrating this picture of Jesus he's just gotten. And we'll leave you with it. It's really cool. Um, chapter 12, verse 1. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you're angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. And here's that theme of trust. So if you're marking trust, right? I will trust and will not be afraid. And don't forget, Isaiah's name means Yahweh saves. So when, when Isaiah says, surely God is salvation, he's, he's saying, this is my name here, right? Yahweh saves. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. With joy, with joy, you will draw water from the well of salvation. You will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make, deeds, make known his deeds among the nations. I love this. Verse 5. Sing praises to the Lord. For he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy. And okay, mark this very last phrase. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. That phrase, Holy One of Israel, is repeated over 70 times in the book of Isaiah. It is a unique phrase in the sense of its usage in the book of Isaiah. And what it means is the different one of Israel. Your king, God, is different from every king you've ever had. And so you're just going to see this over and over again. He's the Holy One, which means he doesn't think like you. He doesn't act like you. He doesn't make alliances like you. He doesn't do war like you. He doesn't pay tribute like you. He is different in every way. And he's going to be your salvation. And I just see that in contrast to Ahaz, Hezekiah, and these earthly kings of Judah who are going to blow it over and over again. All right, I'm done. Your thoughts, comments, questions. Well, you're getting a real barf here. I'm sorry, but I can't help myself. This is fun. And uh, did you learn anything about Isaiah tonight? What did you learn? All right, so let's. You see how important it is to look at the the sections as a chunk? Like, you got to read 7 through 12 as a chunk. You have to see it as the Ahaz narrative. That needs to remind you of stuff. Chapter 1 through 6, Golden Age of Jeroboam. 7 through 12, Ahaz narrative. And then we're going to come to 13 next week, and we're going to see the oracles against the nations. And you got to think of 13 through 20-something, probably, probably break it around 24, as the judgments against the nation, right? So you got to think in sections. In that way. I think what is striking me the most is just such like the stark contrast in the language about the you know the judgment, the 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 prophecy, and then the person of Jesus. I think it's so beautiful and it's it's just astounding. It's really amazing to see. Just yeah. to see the contrast, it's really driving home the point of. Just like Jesus is, you know, your lifeboat. 
not to be totally cheesy, but like, I mean, you know, because there's a lot of description, descriptive language about how awful things were and how scary things were, you know, and to even say like, don't fear. And it's like, really? I mean, you know, my whole nation is, you know, slashing and burning here. So, but it's just the language is really beautiful. And that's really, that's really uh, meaningful to me reading this. You know, that's good, Mill. And you know what? I, I've just been thinking about Philippians 3. I've been reading it and trying to encourage myself with it because I'm greedy and I'm selfish and left to myself. And I just need to remember the surpassing greatness. And, and, and Paul uses the word value, the surpassing value of knowing Jesus and um let me read it to you real quick because it's exactly what you said. Listen, Paul says in Philippians 3, whatever gains I have, I regard as loss because of the greatness of Christ. I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus. For his sake, I willingly suffer the loss of all things and regard them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him. And I think, oh God, yeah. help me mm -hmm. take that seriously. I believe that about 10% of my day and I want to bump that to 20 or 30 percent. Yeah. Absolutely. That's amazing. I don't know, Tom, maybe you just got to sin a little bit more <laughs> and destroy your life. And then you'll you'll understand what that means. <laughs> Well, it's just, you know, I mean, I think like, okay, and I'm talking to myself here. Why are we so afraid to tell our friends and neighbors about Jesus? Um, a lot of reasons, but when we really start to think of him as the only lasting healing that God could ever bring into somebody's life, it'll truly heal them every, every, every part of their brokenness forever. It is exactly what Isaiah is trying to tell us. And it, it gives me a little bit more boldness to like invite somebody to the alpha course that we're going to do in March, right? And I was just thinking about that today with my cycling buddies. I'm like, these guys need Jesus so bad. <laughs> and I just am so tired of getting rejected by them. Because I invite them to all kinds of stuff and they never come. <clears throat> and I'm like, and I'm just, I was riding today with these guys thinking, I got to double down and ask them again. I got to ask them. I got to give them another opportunity. One day they'll get tired and say, all right, come. I'll come. Can't hurt to keep trying. I hope so. Just be faithful. All right, everybody. We've had enough of Isaiah, I'm sure. <laughs> See you later. Have a great night. You too. Thanks, Tom. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.